Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Dexter. How are you? Uh, fine. So good. we just okay. maximize my slides, so it's like uh, making sure I had a good story to tell. Um, yeah. So just give me one more second, because there was one more video I wanted to have in my slides. Um, OK. Takes me just one second. I, I have everything. Have no this. worries. Where I have everything. I'm also integrating with the other channels to all right, I guess we're live. Okay. Awesome. All right. Play. I'll just give uh, an introduction in Arabic if that's okay with you. Yeah, and then we will continue in English. طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا ومرحبا بكم معكم أخوكم طاهر البلوي المؤسس والمدير التنفيذي لوادي العباقرة مع انطلاقة هاكاثون تصميم وتصنيع جهاز التنفس الصناعي مفتوح المصدر يسرنا استضافة الدكتور ديفيد كوارتيز شريك مؤسس والمدير التقني لشركة أردوينو الأداة اللي سهلت على العالم وسرعت من عملية النمذجة لمشاريع الإلكترونيات كذلك استخداماتها التجارية بمجال إنترنت الأشياء حيتحدث الدكتور ديفيد عن بعض المشاريع الحالية المتعلقة بتصميم وصناعة جهاز التنفس الصناعي ودور أردوينو في تسهيل العملية يمكنكم كتابة الأسئلة والتصويت لرفع أهم الأسئلة المطروحة ليتم الإجابة عليها في نهاية اللقاء بإذن الله Hello everyone and thank you for attending as you know, we have started the uh, open source uh, ventilator hackathon. Uh, we wanted to help the participants by inspiring them and sharing some of the current projects out there. And we are lucky to have one of the most inspiring people in the field to take us through some of them. We will be taking your questions at the end of the uh, talk. Please feel free to write them down and upvote the questions so we can answer it. Dr. David, thank you for accepting the invitation. Glad to have you with us. Okay. Um, yeah, hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, I have to say I'm, I, uh, I mean, it's hard to make a, a talk in 20 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I'm going to try to do my best. And uh, I have some slides, but I also have some, I also have some uh, extra materials. And uh, they they are part of uh, both the work that I am doing at Arduino, but also the work I'm doing as a volunteer at the COVID-19 initiative in Spain. Uh, so I, I want to make very clear to everybody that uh, none of the prototypes I'm going to show are have been made by me. Uh, this is so very important. So they've been by people in the community and they have different origins. And I will try to credit everybody that has been doing the things I'm going to be showing. Um, but if I make any mistakes, I, I apologize in advance because it's been a crazy month <laughs> and uh, uh, we're working double and triple shifts to make everything uh, work. So it's possible that I may I might make some mistakes and, and as I said, I apologize already. Uh, yeah, in, that's case, okay. in case that happens, well, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody deserves uh, the credit they deserve for the work True. they've been doing, True. obviously. So... Uh, let me just like uh, start my slideshow and share my screen. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> so I hope you can see my slides properly. Yeah. Uh, just, just for my own comfort, I'm just going to move the chat and everything on my window so that I can follow up the call. And I think, yeah, okay. So uh, I will start by just making a bit of a statement. I, I made this at the Arduino COVID-19 conference a couple of days ago. Um, but I mean, I, I'm not ashamed of repeating it because I want to make a statement about what, what's Arduino's position in this case. And uh, I have the feeling that my computer is a little bit slow. So uh, let me just, before I continue, let me just close one program that I have running, which is Mendeley that I use for my academic papers. And that is like sure. completely taking all of my, all of my uh, system 
Uh, you don't notice this, but I basically uh, don't see myself when I'm talking. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the kind of like the situation. So I just have to close that software and go. So now it's a lot smoother video connection for me. Awesome. Okay. So uh, yeah. Well, we know where we're here. So the the world is is in a terrible moment right now. Things are happening that we never thought that will happen. And uh, and uh, yes, microphone closer to my mouth so you can hear me better. And uh, uh, well, everybody in society is trying to do their best to give a hand and help out. And uh, Arduino is no exception. And uh, as you know, over 3 million people have been diagnosed uh, almost 3 million people have been diagnosed uh, with COVID-19, but that's a lot less than we actually know are infected, because as we know, not everybody can be tested. For example, I live in Sweden, and only those that have clear symptoms and are brought to the hospital are tested. So we know for a fact that there is a whole lot of people that might be asymptomatic or that might have gone through the mild version of the disease that were never tested. Uh, our whole world is into an economic recession. And if it's not right now, it's going to come very soon. And our life has stopped being as we know. Um, in some countries, like for example, Spain or Italy, the world has completely stopped. Uh, only today in Spain, people were allowed to come on the street with their children after six weeks of confinement. So this is really, um, this is really a challenge, how to deal with this at the societal level. So... Yeah, who doesn't want to help, right? So um, there is a lot of challenges. And one of the challenges, and this is why you guys are in this hackathon, is designing reliable ventilators and respirators. And they have to be designed in record time. And uh, I was having a conversation with the head of innovation of the Cotec Foundation, which is the Spanish foundation for innovation, whose president is actually the king of Spain, or honorary president, but yeah, anyway. And um, turns out that in Spain, there was a process initiated uh, where there was an invi open invitation for anybody with a skill to produce a ventilator to do so. And there is over 70 proposals only in Spain. So this is really, a, <laughs> this is really an amazing, amazing situation for innovation. And I think this will be studied um, uh, this will be studied in the history of innovation for very long. Uh, in the words of, of Jorge Barrero, which is this person I spoke about, the director of this foundation, we witnessed in 10 days the innovation of 10 years. So people from all over the place, inventors, doctors, um, I'm talking medical doctors, of course, engineers, uh, car manufacturing companies, <laughs> you know, everybody were designing and manufacturing ventilators and respirators. And the Spanish Office of the Medical, the Production of Medical Devices and Analysis of and Validation of Medical Devices created a new special regulation so that in case it was needed, these machines could be put into use. So seven teams out of 70 managed to go through the trials with animals that would allow them to actually try these machines on humans if it was needed. And as I said, this is an unprecedented amount of innovation in a super short time span. Uh, but there is these challenges. One of the challenges is how to get materials in the time of lockdown. And at Arduino, we, we work really hard to make sure that our materials are available for everybody. As you know, Arduino is the cheapest, uh, most available, electronic device for any kind of use. And one of them is build the intelligence of medical devices. And, uh, and when we say this at Arduino, we say this with a huge disclaimer that says, well, it is not our responsibility. If people make something, it falls on them. We will help them with software, we'll help them with hardware, but we are not ultimately connecting anybody to these machines because that requires a certain level of understanding of medical electronics. And I hope that when you people are working in designing respirators in this project, in this hackathon right now, 
I really hope that you are uh, putting a doctor in your team. I hope that you are putting a person with knowledge of medical electronics in your team. And if you haven't done it yet, please look for one because those two skills are very needed. One is needed because um, the human body is probably the most complex machine we will ever know about. And uh, it requires somebody that knows how to, um, how to operate a machine that is connected to the lungs of a person. You know, that is not trivial. Um, I've, I've learned a lot during the last weeks, and I can tell you, I still don't consider myself even half skilled as a doctor that goes through a nine years long education. So uh, I can tell you, you definitely need a, a person with that knowledge in your team. And when it comes to a medical electronics engineer, I, I did study medical electronics as a student. And, um, and uh, the, the, the challenge here is to comply with as many regulations as possible when you design a machine, um, just for, for the sake of whoever is going to be attached to it. And as I say here, the last challenge is facing the homologation process. And uh, again, just to make this very clear, the homologation process depends on the authorities on each one of the countries that you guys are living at. So, uh, so it's very important that you ask the question to the Ministry of Health um, eventually the Ministry of Industry and try to get regulations. At the European level, the, the European Commission managed to get all of the norms for medical devices open for the time being. And at the Spanish level, the agency regulating the manufacturing um, and, and use of medical devices as well as medicines, they uh, made a special regulation for testing machines under these very special circumstances. They also made very clear that the moment the alarm situation was over, those machines were automatically invalidated. So they created a legal framework to allow these machines to be used. Uh, of course, you can always say, if you have the option of dying or being going to the machine, what would you do? And of, I, I of course agree with that from, from a personal perspective, I can take that risk. But as a designer of technology, I have to be aware that machines can go both ways. They can help, but they can also hurt. And it's very important that whatever you guys do, you cover yourself up for your own good, but especially for the good of the person or the people that will be connected with these machines. So uh, covering yourself up doesn't mean to get a good lawyer. It means to make sure you know what you're doing. Okay. Uh, but I have to say, I'm, I'm really proud to say that the Arduino community really stands up for the challenge. As Arduino, we've got a lot of requests for help. Uh, we have experts in uh, firmware and hardware design that been, have been assisting the most serious projects that have been coming along. People have been getting thousands of boards to be included into machines that are going to be used with patients. So this is very, very important so that you know these machines are being built in the world and they're being put uh, most likely in motion by professionals. So uh, I would say, you know, from an innovation perspective, don't hesitate, but again, be ultra careful. So uh, as Arduino, the things we've been doing is to offer technical know-how to groups and individuals. This means we've been talking to universities, companies, inventors, uh, doctors at hospitals, everybody. We've been giving supply chain advice because you know what happened is that in the beginning of the pandemic, China was locked down. So there was no access to a lot of materials. Now Europe and the US are locked down, which means a lot of the companies that are typically manufacturing cannot manufacture because they are locked down. As Arduino, we actually provided our distributed network of uh, suppliers so that anybody can get materials. So if somebody comes and says, I need 10,000 Arduino Omegas to make respirators, we automatically unlock those 10,000 for that person to make sure those respirators are done. So medical devices are priority zero for Arduino. So this is the, one of the main things that I have to say we are doing to ensure that things are working as they should in this case. Um, 
Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, we, we've been collaborating at different levels and I'm going to show some projects of people that, that have been working with respirators. And uh, I've been trying to put URLs for you to navigate through them and find more information. Um, yeah, what, one of the things that we did at Arduino, so before I continue, is so that we arranged a conference that is fully recorded and is available on YouTube, where we analyze a bunch of different respirators. Some of them were very creative, uh, like this one that uses like two tanks of water to, to produce the right amount of pressure to push into the lungs and so on. Um, this one that's controlled by artificial intelligence and so on and so forth. Um, so I recommend that you take a look at, at those videos because you will find both uh, advices on ideas. You will find advices on um, on uh, legal aspects, but also you find technical advice. There is a full conference of an hour with uh, our head of hardware where he's advising which ways to proceed with these different designs from different teams. Uh, yeah, so which Arduino words have been used right now? The ones that you see in this table have been reported to be used in different projects. And sorry for the prices, it was not my intention to make any kind of marketing, but it's just to give you guys an idea on the price range of the boards people are using in their projects. No, yeah, please do, we're all Arduino fans anyway. <laughs> Yeah, well, but as I said, my intention was was actually give you an over an overview of the boards that are used. So the price is interesting from the perspective that it gives you an idea on how much it will cost to put the intelligence in your in your system. But you know, uh, for example, I cannot say who bought this, but I can tell you the day ten thousand Arduino Nano everywhere bought for a bunch of respirators. So it's like uh, uh, no, no, sorry, three thousand, not ten thousand. I say wrong, three three thousand. Um, so this is this is a fact. So these these boards are being used for prototyping and for um, uh, uh, manufacturing. The two most used boards at this point are the Arduino Nano and the Arduino Mega. Those two boards are used massively in different machines, and I would say all over the world, really. So let's let's see a collection of different machines, and uh, I added uh, I added also one that is not necessarily done with Arduino, but has two two versions: one with Arduino and one with a PLC, just to give you two flavors and give you some ideas. So we have identified three main types of machines. There are the purely mechanical machines; they are controlled by non-digital electronics, like for example relays. There is the compressed compressed air solutions. You have to take into account that some or many hospitals have compressed air served directly into the rooms. And the only thing you need to do is to control some bulbs. I have to anticipate that for this one, I have not found a uh, the image I wanted, so I don't have an image, but I, I can tell you how it works anyway. Uh, and there is the bug-based solutions, which is the where you find most of the solutions these days, also is in the back, back based. Um, it's because of this publication made by MIT in 2010 that many people have read and it's inspiring a lot of people on how to make a ventilator. So I hope the th things I'm gonna say now will help you go into the right direction and save you some time. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so the first one is the open ventilator. And this one comes from Brazil. This was presented uh, at the Arduino conference and it's made by a team of people. Um, the person that presented at the Arduino conference was Marcos Mendez, if I remember correctly. And uh, he's a um, um, clinical engineer. And here you see the GitHub account, github.com slash pop solution slash open ventilator. And it's a really nicely documented project. And uh, it's a purely mechanical, uh, or electromechanical device. And the idea is that it's using a couple of uh, relays, it uses a relay with some switches to uh, generate the cycle of uh, pumping air. And the cycle of pumping air, as you know, is faster when you push air into the lungs and slower when you take the air from the lungs. So you might have to push in in a second while exhaust in six seconds. So it requires the machine to pump and push 
uh, differently. Oh, is there a gray? Okay, yeah, sorry. This is uh, the chat window. Is it better now? I guess somebody asked yes. a question. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just wanted yes. to have we, the chat we, window so I could actually see whether there were any questions like that one. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So anyway, we, we're going to take also the questions at the end of the session. If you yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was more a request to to remove my uh, my window okay. from the from the window. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, this this design uh, this uh, this illustration take it from the from the reference I just gave you on GitHub. Okay. Uh, it's a it's a super simple device, and it's proposing this is a super emergency device that's going to cost less than thirty euros. So they have made a, a proposal for three different models. This is the cheapest one of the models, and I wanted to show it show it to you because it's the the cheapest, absolute cheapest thing you can do. And they have this uh, video showing how it works, and you see it's a laser cut version of it. Uh, has a, uh, a PSU and it's a self-made pump for the air. It's made with a piece of a car tire and a couple of laser cut discs. And I hope you can see the video. And it has a very strong statement saying that people that can't, that don't earn more than 10 euros in a day, how can they afford a machine that costs thousands of euros, right? So that's a statement. So that's why I try to make a machine that costs uh, more or less 30 euros or $30 to make. So the, the machine is one you see on the right of the video. The one on the left is, is checking that the, that the system works properly. Okay, so it's a simulation of the ventilation. Um, then an iteration of this comes from Vanderbilt University in the United States. And um, you just need to Google Vanderbilt University and respirator and you will find the, the place. And uh, what they've done is this other machine that is punching an existing bag. And as I said, there is two different types of bags. There is the Ambu bag that is, uh, uh, is used and it can provide air for about three to four hours in the way, because of the way it works. And there is another type of bag that is called the Jason Rees bag. And the Jason Rees bag is the one that properly operated can keep a person alive for days. Because of the specific situation with the COVID-19, a person might be intubated for 15 to 20 days. So this means that by design, the AMBU-based solutions are not good for the worst case patients. Uh, ideally, hospitals should have everything, a bit of everything, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, so, just keep this in mind, but you need to have uh, like Ambu bags for patients that are bad, but not the worst. Jason Reese ones for the ones that are absolutely the worst or eventually compress air. And uh, you might use also the Ambu bags with masks for patients that are having mild symptoms. Uh, the truth is that when a patient is experiencing the, the worst phases of the disease, they need to be intubated. So we have to go for an invasive solution. And this has been the challenge for most people, how to design invasive respirators. And you might have seen respirators using uh, scuba diving masks and so on. That's for really mild cases. That is for really, really mild cases. I'm gonna show you one of those towards the end of the presentation, okay? But uh, the challenge has been to design these ones that are really going straight into the lungs of the patient. So this version here is like the previous one we just saw. They actually had one that was purely mechanical before, and now they made one that uses an Arduino Nano, or sorry, Arduino Uno, but they don't mention it, but you see it on the video if you look carefully.
you see the the Arduino is down there. <laughs> it was just down there on the left hand side, but. Um, So the whole point, as he's saying in this video, is that you should be able to build this ventilator with the parts that you have available at home. So they used, uh, they sourced the parts they could find. And of course, the, they are looking at the ventilator as the machine that pushes air, okay? And, and it's very important that you realize that it, you don't just have to push air, you also have to sense that the person is trying to breathe. And this is a very complex uh, mechanism. So you need to have a sensor that detects when the person is making the, the attempt to breathe so that the machine is pushing the air in that moment. And eventually, if the person is not even able of making that movement, then you should push the air if the person is not having the ability to breathe by, by him or herself. I, I'm, I'm, I guess you guys have already been researching these different topics. I just want to, to make clear that you need sensors to make that happen. So that's why these people change their first version into this one that can actually measure with some basic pressure sensors uh, whether the, the respiration is fully assisted or is just part, partly assisted. So let's take a look at the next one. And uh, this is a, uh, this is an Ambu-based uh, example. Again, just it's like the previous one. The difference is that this one uh, is an interesting it's an interesting, uh, yeah, somebody saying on the chat that Ambu is not lasting for very long uh, because patients, uh, is, Ambu is, are used on, uh, are used on uh, ambulances and so on and so forth. And it's true, but in Spain, we have had Ambu is being designed and tested for up to three days in animals. Uh, it's very clear that they cannot last much longer than that. Um, so there's been experiments that probably would have never been done before, you know, but because of the extreme circumstances, people have gone through amazing tests in record time. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, the, the problem is that not everything might be documented and we're fighting to make sure everything is documented because of the importance that this will have for the future. So the reason I want to show this uh, device is because of this test that these people conducted. <laughs> this is an anechoic chamber um, and it's used for measuring radiation. <laughs> and uh, whenever you design an electro electronic device, you have to go through this test, among others. In this test, you check that your machine is not producing any interferences that might attack, uh, attack between air quotes, of course, other machines in the hospital and eventually not let them properly function. And uh, so this is a respirator made by the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And um, they made this test in their first prototype. They didn't have a proper housing for the electronics. Um, and this antenna you see in the bottom, this red thing on the bottom is an antenna and it's detecting a 16 megahertz signal on the air. Well, guess what works at 16 megahertz? The clock of the Arduino Mega. <laughs> and uh, of course they were getting an interference. I mean, uh, I, I, I spare you the pleasure of looking at the picture of their electronics construction because it was a real pain. And uh, I'm saying this because these people were very careful to make these measurements because in Europe, you need to pass a CE labeling for any medical device. And CE, CE labeling implies interference test, like this one. Like there is no radiated signals going through the air, going to other devices. There is no signals going through the power cable, going to other devices, super important. On the other hand, you have to provoke an 8,000 uh, volts <laughs> static discharge on the device and it should not reset because the machine should not stop when it's going to a person by any circumstances, unless the doctor or the nurse presses the button to stop. So, uh, so that therefore you need a really, really good, um, you really, you need a really good shielding for this. Uh, so, 
Disciple then went for solution number two, <laughs> and it was to use an old PC box for their for their shielding, and this worked. This worked, though I wouldn't really recommend to have inflatable things inside these sharp metallic boxes. But uh, this thing passed the test, and um, the reason why I wanted to show is because when you're under emergency mode, <clears throat> you can actually do whatever, and. Uh, these PC boxes, they exist in every university by the hundreds, and so it's possible to build them into something else. Um, yeah, they also use like um, <clears throat> very cheap sensors, which is one of the values of this design for checking the, the pressure. And just let me tell you who, which team did this, because I think one of the most beautiful things is to tell you that the team that designed this device is the research team that is they are specialized in the atmospheric research for other planets. <laughs> so they, they actually have missions on Mars and things like this. So literally everybody, absolutely everybody designed respirators in the last, uh, in the last month. Uh, there is there is also one made by NASA that was just announced like two days ago. I actually didn't have time to put it in my slides, but if you if you Google NASA respirator Arduino, you're gonna find it very quick. Um, this is a very similar. It, it's not in the PC box, but it's a similar concept. <clears throat> so respirator 2020 is um, <clears throat> is one that is done by the coronavirus makers community in Spain, and this is a community that has been working. It's a community of 16,000 people that volunteered since day one to produce a lot of different uh, personal protection equipment in Spain. And um, so this is, the, this is the drawing of the idea. And you see the shape of this uh, piece is key uh, as for providing this asymmetrical inflating and deflating of the bag. The difference between the other the other designs and this one is that this one works with a Jason Reese bag. The Jason Reese bag is designed to uh, mix air in the right way, and it works with the patient for I wouldn't say indefinitely, but definitely works for the full time of intubation, which is fifteen days. Uh, unlike the Ambu bag, and it's been mentioned on the chat, by the way. <clears throat> so. Uh, so Respirator 2020 is an evolution of another one. This one runs on a PLC from Siemens, as you can see on the image here. And it runs on a NEMA, uh, I think it's NEMA 23 motor. Uh, don't try NEMA 17s, by the way. They are not strong enough. Take them out of the list. So go for 23 or 34 right away. Don't, don't waste your time with smaller motors. It will not work. Um, and so this machine, uh, the ability of this machine actually, because basically using the PLC is that it can actually connect many machines using standard PLC connectivity. And this was one of the main concerns. What happens when you have hundreds of people intubated, when you have very cheap machines and you don't have enough um, professionals to take care of those machines? Because you cannot leave a person intubated and then just run away. You need to have some sort of like control mechanism so the beauty of this one is that they added this uh, centralized control system where they can have up to 50 devices connected to a single screen. So that's uh, to give you an idea. This is also a very interesting engineering challenge. Um, this is one of the videos of this respirator. And uh, here you can see a test. And this is, a, this is a zero calibration of the mechanical uh, parts of this. By the way, all of this design is completely open source and is fully available on the internet so that, uh, so that you know. Uh, and then uh, this is the open source version of that one. This one's completely an open source technology. It has an Arduino Mega as the main, as the main controller. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, this one has uh, Beaglebone, Beaglebone Black to, con to control the screen. So it's very important to separate interface from the other part because this one could run without the screen as well with just a couple of potentiometers to select modes. 
uh, so could run fully on an Arduino Mega, but they implemented the UI to assist people uh, that are operating the machine. This one, I mean, I do have the videos with animals. I'm not going to show them to you, okay? But uh, this one has passed uh, all of the tests with animals, all of the clinical tests. And it's right now on the ethical team uh, at the hospital trying to make a decision whether it's going to be tested on humans or not. Because at this point in Spain, there is no more need of trying these machines because right now there is enough machines, uh, commercial machines that are working. Because I, I like to talk about the three three plans, the plan plans A, B, and C. And the plan A is the government has enough money and there is enough offer in the world so you can go buy machines. You know, the demand matches the offering. You go buy, you use them, that's it. There is the plan B, which is you put the companies in your country to manufacture the machines that you can buy. And Spain, funny enough, had two companies manufacturing respirators, but they were making 100 machines a year <laughs> and they needed to make 100 machines a day. <laughs> so, uh, so they were intervened by the government. And in a, in a time sum of four weeks, they, they managed to ramp up the production. So that's really quite an achievement. And then there is the plan C. And the plan C is, let's say that, that plan A and B fail. Plan A has been failing systematically because all of the countries in the world have been fighting for medical supplies. Plan B is take, takes time to put in motion. Besides, you might lack some parts. Plan C is go creative, do whatever, give me plans. So this presentation has been all about plan C, has been about ways that we can do from the maker community, from the Arduino community, to provide with solutions in case in the case plans A and B fail. Okay. But I think we all need to be very humble and understand that our contribution might never be put in motion. That ideally it should never be put in motion. Ideally, our contribution should just be there for the just in case. I know that fortunately it's not gonna be like this. In some places, our contribution is the only contribution. But you know. Uh, we know after the, releasing the designs for these machines that have been showing you, we know countries like Ecuador, for example, is manufacturing its own machines based on these plans. We know that Guatemala is looking at the same. We know that Mexico is looking at the same, and so on and so forth. So regarding this com the comments on the chat, so this is a CPAP design. And this is made on an Arduino Nano. And uh, it's, been re it's been released in record time as an academic publication <laughs> with tests with humans. But it's CPAP. So as a CPAP design, it doesn't need to, to go through a, a test with animals. Okay, so basically this is a mask that you put in your mouth and turn on the machine. And it's a very simple design. And uh, if, you, if you Google University of Barcelona respirator, you will find this and you find the paper and the paper includes the full design, everything, good to go. You know, all the schematics, everything, okay? So, uh, so yeah, so this is the this is design I just show you and you see again, runs on an Arduino Nano. Um, because for the electronics for most of these devices, you don't need a lot. You don't need anything but something that controls a motor, uh, whether, whether a stepper motor or a fan, like in this case, and um, and then that's it. <laughs> it's like it's a no-brainer, really. It's from a logic perspective, it's very easy. Is the sense is a is a closed loop that matters how you measure in order to put the machine to control, and that you make the right tests so that you can make sure you can comply with the different circumstances. And also, it's very important because as engineers, we might not be familiar with the exact need of the machine. The exact need of the machine is defined by the patient, but also by the medical professionals who are those that have to operate this machine. So it's super important we respect their perspective. And so I'm going to close on a happy note um, because I have to tell you there is other things you can also do. So respirators, of course, is very important, but I am also a volunteer on the coronavirus community in Spain, which is a really big community, as I said earlier. Uh, you know, the easiest design, the Spanish community of makers has delivered over half a million of these to 
nurses, doctors, policemen, army um, officers, and now we are going for stores, you know, the bakery, the butcher, whatever, you know. Now we're making a design for children so they can personalize it and make their own uh, designs on top, uh, as well as uh, as well as masks. So those are the two things that we are producing the most, insane amounts of them. And I'm saying this because of the process where we actually start to collaborate with companies. You know, the makers community in Spain, we design everything for free and we give it away for free. We manufacture it and we eventually get some materials from people so we can make more and give more for free. But the problem is that, for example, the masks, you have to make 40 million <laughs> a day. <laughs> you know, if everybody were to go out on the street and they had to use disposable masks, you will need 40 million masks a day for Spain. You know, it's impossible that makers are going to be stitching masks at their home. I mean, let's be clever about this, right? So, so at some point, you need to give it away to somebody that can manufacture. So, for example, with this design, this is called the Hancock mask. We went to a factory and proposed them to use our, our STL files to create an injection molding version of it. So these things are now produced by the tens of thousands a day by four or five different factories in Spain. So we, the makers, donated our know-how to these factories once we have been testing things. And actually, last Friday, we got this design approved by the Ministry of Industry of Spain. So now this design being manufactured by injection molding in factories, designed by the makers, is now the official design that can be given away to people. So this is a very important moment in history where I think the maker movement has, you know, has stood up to the challenge, and has produced something and given it back to society. And we did it, you know, out of goodwill. And uh, I think it's very important that, that this is brought up. Uh, also, another big challenge is masks for really challenging environments. And I want to show you this one because I'm, I mean, the person trying it out is Miguel Angel, who is a, is a postdoc in physics. Uh, and uh, he's a very clever guy. And he's designing this special mask that is going to be used in. Um, intense care units, because this is the next thing. These things are gonna be needed if you're gonna be at a hospital with hundreds of patients. You know, protecting the doctors is thing number one. Spain is the country in the world with the highest amount of infected medical professionals because of the lack of personal protection devices. So we've been working against the clock and we are already late, but we still continue to work. So this mask is made of silicone. It's we made injection molding silicone because it's the only way you can do it. So we collaborate with companies to be able of doing this. And here Miguel Angel has, has been wearing the mask for five hours to make sure that you can make a normal work day and even exercise and not feel an exhaustion because of the lack of oxygen. So again, this design is, is completely open and we are now looking at how to manufacture it massively so we can serve it to people. This is obviously going to be really interesting because 3M is the only manufacturer of really good masks in the world. And we're going to make one that's going to cost a, hundred, a fraction of it, like a hundred times less. You know, it's going to be very interesting. Um, so right now, uh, Miguel Angel is experimenting with different materials in the lab. Uh, so because the other key aspect is the filter. So we've experimented with HEPA filters, which is material you can get from uh, vacuum cleaning bags. So it's actually relatively easy to get with um, the home context. But there's also experiments made with algae, with uh, different types of uh, materials. And I have to say, the algae is a very promising material. So I wouldn't disregard experimenting with uh, materials from the sea as a way to design filters. Your algae provide 69% filtering capabilities at this point. And we have it tested in the lab. So, uh, yeah. Somebody's asking here where the CAD models for the molds for the, for the face shields, they, they are definitely uh, open source. The, well, the STLs, 
I mean, every fac every every factory has to use their own STLs or have to use the STLs to design their own mold. So the STLs are open source. Okay, uh, I think that's it. So. Uh, you know, if you want to get to know more from Arduino, as I said in this presentation, I presented some things that use Arduino and some things that don't use Arduino. Uh, because the most important thing for us at Arduino is that we help each other. <laughs> and sometimes you don't need Arduino to do that. You need to make a face shield or a mask. You don't need an Arduino board. But I think they are equally important. Um, so if you want to be up to date with uh, the Arduino conference that I, I talked about earlier, you can go to this URL as it says here. And you will also find contacts to the Arduino forum where you can get help for your projects. And now I'm ready for any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, it's really uh, uh, great knowledge and great uh, projects out there. And there's a lot of resources that I think the participants can uh, learn a lot from it. Not only the participants, but the public as well and uh, to see how the makers could help uh, in this crisis time. Um, so we'll move to the questions. If anyone have a question, could you please write it in the Q&A section so we can uh, have a better look at the, the questions over there, not in the chat. Okay, so Mohammed was saying, can you repeat the info about the motor? Which, which project, Mohammed? Yeah, okay. Uh, the the projects that are using motors to push uh, bags, like uh, the Ambus and the Jason Reese and so on, they should be using at least the NEMA 23 or NEMA 23. You know, 3D printers use NEMA 17 and that is too small. So uh, you should definitely jump into a larger one. So it's NEMA 23 or NEMA 34 are the recommended sizes. And uh, of course, it's more challenging from the perspective of having the proper driver. And uh, when it comes to a driver, actually getting drivers from the internet at this point is not that complicated. They are not very expensive. Um, the most expensive part of the whole circuit typically is the motor, actually. Um, but a whole respirator imports is in the 150 euros range tops, if you're unlucky. Uh, so yeah, as I said, NEMA or NEMA 23 or 34, those are the sizes that you should take into account. Okay. So uh, Hamoud was asking, would you please uh, let me know the YouTube channel name? Um, I think he was talking about one of the projects, but as, as Doctor was saying, you can check the link and you will find all the resources. Uh, Allah, is saying any advice on how to protect a project with an open source license? The ultimate question, <laughs> license until it's issued. <laughs> okay, look, I think the most important part is that you protect yourself. <laughs> so yeah. uh, exactly. go for a license that has a disclaimer that says that you are not guilty for anything people do with your design. That's like step zero is that one. You know, the most important part, you are doing this for the goodwill, you should try to protect yourself, period. Then again, many people are concerned with the idea, oh, we're makers, we're doing this. People are, are uh, taking our knowledge and they are eventually getting rich out of it and selling it. Well, I would ask you this one thing. Let's say that your father gets sick and the only opportunity is that there is a company that has enough money to make a bunch of respirators and sell them to your government. Would you mind that they steal your design? I think that's the question you need to ask yourself. This is the ethical question that we all need to ask ourselves. And we have had this fight in Spain a lot, you know, and, you know, there is licenses that allow you to at least get credit for your work. And I have to say the companies in Spain, they also are parents and they also are children from people and they've offered all of their help. So nobody has been trying to get rich in this whole thing. All of the companies, car companies, they put their production lines to design to manufacture respirators. And they're not selling them for 20,000 euros. They're selling them for 3,000 euros. So, uh, so nobody have been really been making money. So I think 
we have to understand this as a collective effort, you know. And if somebody is trying to make money out of it, they will be very unlucky because somebody will come and make it cheaper and kick them out. Exactly. And we've seen this in respirators, but also in face shields and masks and everything. So. Okay. So uh, discovery scientists are saying, can I ask how is important to test IoT device and research before going to market and how long? Okay. Before I take that question, I see that Allah has been continuing he's saying he's, he was saying he's not for credit, but rather for keeping the design open source. Well, if you want to keep the design open source, use an open source license. You can use the open hardware license for the design and the open, any open source license or, or free software license for the software, and that will keep it open source. Just, yeah. uh, you know, if you want people not to close it, then don't use BSD, don't use MIT, you know, use like GPL and use open hardware or a, or a creative commons for the, for the, the plain blueprints. That will help you keeping it open. Sorry, could you repeat the last question again? <laughs> yeah, sure. Can I ask how is it important to test IoT device and research before going to market and how long? Okay, so that is not so, in, so much into the medical part, even though it could be. Uh, but an IoT device, uh, that's a very, it's a very generic question, okay? So I would say, let's say that you are running something that works on Wi-Fi, then you need to make sure that it's compliant with the latest technologies on Wi-Fi and that uh, it can work on different things. Then testing or certification, that's a different, this is a different question uh, because then you, there is different degrees of certification. For example, you need to make sure that your device is not producing electroshocks that will be harming the person holding the device. Like I have my phone here. <laughs> If when I hold my phone, it was giving me electroshocks, I can tell you it would not be passing in the certifications. Okay, so it needs to be self-contained and it has to have some sort of shielding that protects the user. On a medical device, it's even more critical because you cannot anticipate or you cannot allow the machine to give an electroshock to the person that is intubated because that would be basically a roaster machine, you know? So it's like not really okay. Um, so the, the amount of time you have to test a machine on humans is determined by each one of the countries, by the agencies of the of medical devices. So I cannot answer a question like that one because I don't know the legislation for all countries. Uh, so you should check that out. Um, what happened in Spain, and this is what I can tell you, is that the, the Spanish Ministry of Health created a special regulation for the time being. Like all patents were abolished. It doesn't mean that the patents were, are not valid anymore. They are not valid for this time, okay? Uh, on the medical field. Like you could copy any device, you could, you know. The problem is trying to copy a device if you don't have the blueprints is that it's really hard. <laughs> so how are you supposed to do it, right? Sure. <laughs> so as you know, uh, uh, is it Medtronic? Medtronic released their 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 blueprints for their respirator for a respirator. Yeah. One of the old uh, models. Exactly. Yeah, they got so much critique in the in the open source world because it was like, yeah, thank you, but no, thank you. I was like, how are we supposed to copy this thing? You know, it's like, you know, it's like really hard. You know, so. yeah. First time they didn't even put the uh, semantics, and uh, they after uh, after that they put uh, another batch. Without the source code, I think they were removing the bad comments, you know, in, in, <laughs> in the source code before putting it in public. But anyway. Yeah, yeah but, but still, what happens with these devices is they're so specific. I mean, first of all, I give the full credit for releasing their design. I, you know, that's a very, let's say, um, nice hearted uh, thing to do. You know, it's like, yeah. hey, guys you know, we will not make any money on this anymore. Take this. We don't care. If it saves lives, take it. Okay. The problem is that technology is hard to copy. You know, you need to have the supply chain. You need to have the parts. You need to have, you know. So so it's a, that's a, it's a challenge. It's really hard to to copy. So I, I um, 
I would say, uh, on the one hand, I'm really thankful that they did release it because it gave me even more reasons to try to make open source versions of it. <laughs> you know, because uh, because it's hard to copy as it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna have uh, another three questions, uh, mm -hmm. guys, uh, because uh, we have a time with uh, with the doctor, and thankfully he gave us some of his time because, as he said, he's working with the with the community in Spain to help out. So the next question is from Hamad. Are geared uh, DC motors acceptable? I don't know if he's referring to the projects. I haven't seen any project using them except for, I mean, well, the place that you see that the, the, the mechanical ones, they, they don't use stepper motors. They, they use, DC, they use uh, uh, windshield wipers. <laughs> so, you know. So in theory, you can use Heavy any motor. Ones, yeah. uh, if you have the right mechanical construction, you can use any motor. So that's that's that could be a, a way to go. Yeah. You know, it's uh, just remember the really important thing is that you have to push a certain amount of air, which is different for every person. You know, like I I have a really large chest, <clears throat> so I would probably need a lot of more air than my daughter, who is only twelve years old. So. You need you need a certain level of adaptability, and you need to figure out how that's going to happen. For example, a design made in Spain was using wheels of different sizes. You saw that I showed this this video where the wheel is rotating, and that wheel is the one that's activating the the, the pump. Uh, they use different wheels, different sizes for different people, so it will push more air or less air in the same amount of time. Yeah. So, so those are the kind of things that you need to figure out. So the motor doesn't matter as long as you have the right speed, uh, different speeds for in and out, uh, and enough strength. So you might have to have too many gears and then the motor might not be strong enough or whatever. So, yeah. but you know, if you're into mechatronics, you can make the math yourself. Yeah. So uh, this question was actually answered by you during the talk. Can we consider Arduino to be a reliable medical controller for the ventilator, or it's only for a prototype? Okay, so Arduino is used, uh, Arduino is used uh, in, in real life devices, not just in prototypes. Arduino is actually the intelligence in a whole bunch of different commercial devices that people don't know. <laughs> so um, um, the fact that it's used for medical prototypes right now is because Turns out in many hospitals, the researchers are using these Arduino boards for their own prototypes that are actually used with real people. So right now what we see is a jump of the theory to the praxis. We're seeing is a jump from when people were trying things out to the moment when they are putting them in, in real life, you know, not just with experimental patients, but with real people that, you know, might not have signed a waiver saying experiment with my body, right? So, so um, at the end of the day, Arduino boards are breakout boards for, for microcontrollers, <laughs> and we have a pretty nice software to to write your own software and compile your own programs and so on. So the answer is, yeah, it can be used, but you have to go through certification. And a very important thing, actually. Uh, because I, I have learned quite a bit about the Spanish certification process. There is no room for changes. Okay, so when you go into the process of trying your software on an animal, that's the last time you're gonna change anything, unless it really fails, okay? So there, there is no room for software updates. The, the medical devices, they are very restricted on how they can do that. The moment you start your testing, the machine needs to be compliant with a whole bunch of things. And then you will test it with animals. Then you will go through the electric certification. Then you will go through uh, approval for human testing. And then you will do human testing. Typically, this process is very long. can take a year or maybe two. What we've seen is that this process in Spain now has been done in a week or two weeks. So that is what this emergency situation can give you. It can give you speed, but that, you know, speed is, is an enemy of, uh, 
of good software. So yeah. you need to make sure when you make your machine that your software is as final as possible. Very few changes can be implemented. Very, very few changes can be implemented. You know, this is, this is a fact. Because what you certify is a machine that works in a certain way and it should not work in any other magical way. So the IL development stops the moment you start testing. Just keep this in mind. Okay, we've seen this as a problem in many of the prototypes that, that went into testing in Spain. Yes. Okay, so Dr. Tarek is saying regarding Arduino, how durable is it when it's used for continuous, uh, used for continuous for a long time? Yeah, I mean, the processor is designed to run, you know, I would say forever. You know, it's like uh, the, the, the chips that are on the Arduino boards, they are used in industrial devices and they're used all the time. Yeah. So um, the, the boards, I would say the or original Arduino boards, they are designed to last. Uh, um, and as long as you're not writing on the EEPROM, which you should not be doing, unless it's for like a basic configuration, uh, the flash can be reflashed tens of thousands of times, you know, no problem. But you want you will only write the program once and then you can run from that program forever. So yeah. it's not a, so the, you know, the, the, the models I was showing you, the, the one that was using the JSON risk bag, that one has passed all of the tests, all of them included the, the 8,000 volt static discharge on the device. And there is this condition that when you produce that discharge, the device should not reset. So, um, okay. so yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's quite a thing. So, yeah. and that's, a, that's the Arduino Mega on it. <laughs> so that you get yeah. the idea. Okay. So, yeah. so just, uh, just, uh, think that it's not, it's, I mean, the technology is completely standard technology, it's super reliable, uh, it's about shielding properly, it's about <clears throat> making software that doesn't hang, and so on. Okay. And also there is this other thing, and it is that you could use uh, the Arduino Mega, for example. The Arduino Mega chip is over 10 years old, so it's a really well-known technology. So you can find really, really good experts in that chip right now anywhere in the world. So has some flaws, but everybody knows the flaws and you can work around them. Uh, that's, for example, what happens with space technology. When you design space technology, you don't launch the latest chip on space. Or you might do it for an experiment, but the things that run the machines in space are fairly old technology because you need to know exactly how they work. They are not supposed to fail. Yeah. So, so that's what happens with Arduino boards now. The, the classic Arduino boards, the, the chips on them are super reliable. Okay, so the last question is from uh, SSJ. The most important part of manufacturing a ventilator is made of uh, ventilation, is mold of ventilation. Can you, as Arduino company, uh, to make the codes for these molds, well, the ventilation modes are already available open source by groups that have been testing them. Yeah. So if you take a look at the at the different uh, URLs I was giving on the video, uh, you will see that, <clears throat> for example, the Respirator 2020 has a version that runs fully on Arduino. A previous version of it, because that project forked, it's already being called, being called Resistencia 23. That project forked into two different projects. Resistencia 23 continued to work only an Arduino and Respirator 2020 also made a PLC version. So it has both an Arduino version and a PLC version. And uh, all of the code is fully available. So you can just go there and take it. That's it. There is no, there is no trick. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, so I guess that's it, uh, Dr. David. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We are you, really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we're gonna see some, some projects coming out of this hackathon. And uh, we hope also to see great results coming from the community that you are working with in Spain as well. Thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to give you one URL, sorry. I, I should give it to you before, before we go. So it's like Absolutely, this. Yeah. Oh, let me just uh, escape this one. And 
just give you the website. It's in Spanish, but uh, everything for the Spanish community is linked from here. So it's the coronavirusmakers.org. Yeah. And uh, here you will find information about what the project is doing, collaborators that are helping out. I just see it's a lot of collaborators. Uh, so the one thing I could I should recommend you as well is that you figure out a way to uh, to uh, be seen because this is a long distance race. Uh, the coronavirus is not a disease that will end in two months. So I think you guys need to uh, get together, join forces, eventually build an NGO, talk to people in other countries like we're doing tonight, you know, look for more help, uh, get support, get economical support, you know, and, and build more things. It's super important. So this website is, is actually the way we're channeling all of these efforts. So we get both donations in time or money from companies or materials. We get donations in time from, from makers. And we get a lot of requests from hospitals, uh, uh, police, army, whatever, to, to help them get what they need. So it's very important to build this kind of infrastructure. You know, it's not, not everything is software and firmware and hardware. You know, there is a lot of this social infrastructure that will help you continue to work with this that you, that you like over several months. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much for tonight. Thank you. You have a good one. Hey, have Ciao. a great hackathon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.